during the lunch hour. I'm Darnell Hunt, director of the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies and professor of sociology here. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's talk, Fires in the Master's House, Malcolm X, Muslims, and the Black Radical Imagination. And of course, we have Sohail Delatsai. Uh, Sohail and I go a long way back. Um, what, about 14, 15 years now? Oh, I mean, man. You, ha you had to say it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, at that other place across town when he was a grad student, and I was a sociology professor, but you ultimately ended up getting your degree in uh, critical studies. studies. right. Yeah. So he is uh, author of Black Star, Crescent Moon, The Muslim International and Black Freedom Beyond America, and is co-editor with Michael Eric Dyson of Born to Use Mike's Reading Nas's Illmatic. His writing has appeared in The Nation, Counterpunch, Al Jazeera, Souls, and Basketball <laughs> Jones, amongst other uh, outlets. He's written li uh, liner for the 2012 release of the 20th anniversary deluxe, uh, deluxe box set of Rage Against the Machines, self-titled debut album, and the centerpiece in the museum catalog Movement Hip Hop in LA, 1980s to now. He is an associate professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies in the program in African American Studies at the University of California, Irvine. He currently lives in Los Angeles and is working on a graphic novel. Thank you. All right, all right. Is the mic good? I'm not sure. Evan, is Evan here? Is the mic good right now? I, yeah? All right. All right. Thank you all for, uh, for coming. I appreciate the invite, uh, Darnell, um, Alex, for helping to organize it, the bookstore, all of you for coming. Uh, it's an honor to have Robin Kelly here, Mark Sawyer as well. Appreciate being here and all of you guys. So I could share some of my ideas um, with you. I guess you know, I've been I've been doing this kind of like book tour over the last kind of probably month and a half uh, around the country, and uh, the set list gets stale a little bit. <laughs> for those of you who know, so I'm going to try and hopefully maybe mix it up a little bit today, and uh, maybe begin talking about um, a piece that I just wrote about that came out today in Al Jazeera on Asada Shakur. Um, that I call, it's called uh, Are We All Muslim Now? Asada Shakur and the Terror Dome. Um, where I'm really trying to unpack uh, the logic of terrorism, so to speak, if there is a logic to it. There's clearly a logic to it, but um, trying to unpack the word terrorism in terms of how we begin to think about how it codes and undermines kind of radical movements for social justice around the world. And I think part of the piece was looking at the ways in which for many of Asada Shakur's uh, supporters, and I would be one of them, and by, not, by no means all of them, but for many of her supporters, there's this kind of consensus, I think, that they're trying to distance themselves from the word terrorist. Like, how dare you call her that? And why is she on the list with these guys? Um, obviously, it's gender. She's the first woman to have been on the list, so we can begin to talk about that as well. But the consensus is, why is she on the list with these guys? And whoever those guys are. And you know, I think we can begin to try and put together, in our head at least, what those guys, who those guys are, and even what they look like. Um, and so I tried to kind of unpack this, and I talked about the ways in which um, to do that, to create this distance or divide between Asada and, say, other kinds of social justice movements taking place, for example, in Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, or anywhere else in the world, is to actually undermine the very politics that Asada Shakur so valiantly fought and has continued to fight for, right? Um, and for me, it was interesting to draw these connections um, in the piece because they emerged in many ways out of the core issues of my book, which was trying to look at the influence of not only Islam, uh, but also the politics of the Muslim third world on the kind of broader black radical imagination. Um, and one of the chapters that I focus on is the influence of, for example, Algeria um, on the black power imagination um, and the way in which uh, you know, the city of Algiers and the iconic kind of Algerian independence struggle against the French embodied through the film The Battle of Algiers and the work of France Fanon uh, became this kind of... Uh, you know, seminal kind of, they were kind of two seminal texts and flashpoints for thinking about this influence, not to mention the fact that, for example, the first international office, uh, office of the Black Panther Party was in Algiers. It's where Eldridge Cleaver and Kathleen Cleaver emerge after being in exile, ironically, like Asada from Cuba, right? So they, they, they show up at 
the first African, the first Pan-African Congress um, Arts Conference um, in Algiers. Um, and so I talk about this deep influence of uh, not just Islam, but like I said, the politics of the Muslim third world on the black radical imagination. And while for the Panthers it was Algeria, it was also a place called Palestine um, that kind of, kind of sat heavy within kind of uh, black power writings, especially for Huey P. Newton. And the legacy continues, um, as I mentioned in the piece in Al Jazeera today, with Angela Davis, Alice Walker, Cynthia McKinney, Robin Kelly, who've been very vocal about Palestinian self-determination um, and the brutal Zionist architecture that's in place there. Um, so, so this is part of what I try to trace out in the book and really if we want to think about um, for me, you know, how, how we think about the book in terms of like contemporary issues is obviously very important because in many ways the book is um, a prehistory to 9-11. Um, I've tried to really frame the, the book as this prehistory because if we think about the current moment uh, where we're sitting now um, with Barack Hussein Obama um, as the president, um, as I mentioned in the book, um, you know, an August 2010 Pew poll came out. Um, now this is two years um, after he was supposedly vetted by the 2008 election. 2008 election, he won. Right? He was vetted. He was considered the legitimate president of the United States. Excuse me while I get some water. And this poll that comes out almost two years after, August 2010, finds that 61% of Americans believe that Barack Obama is or might be a Muslim. Right? Now, not 61% of the Tea Party. <laughs> Not 61% of the Republican Party, 61% of all of you, well, this might be a skewed sample being that we're at UCLA and the Bud Center and right, but 61% of Americans believe that, a, uh, that, Hussein, that Barack Hussein Obama is or might be a Muslim, right? And as I write about in the book, that this was really a deeper seated national anxiety over the legacy of Malcolm X and black internationalism. Right. It was a. It was a really an, a, a a way of trying to another a, you know fear about blackness defining itself beyond the boundaries of the U.S. nation state, right? And this fear of Malcolm, I argued in the book, is what kind of cast this long and enduring shadow over uh, the black radical tradition in the post World War II era, particularly when it comes to the forces that I'm talking about, the politics of the Muslim third world and the black radical tradition, right? So, while today blackness through Obama and the kind of consensus orthodoxy of uh, uh, mainstream black politics, um, while blackness, US empire, um, which is at war with the Muslim third world and how the figure of the Muslim has come to dominate in many ways, become the archetypal other to US empire, with this kind of relationship that has emerged in the post 9-11 moment, I tried to tell a radically different history. A, a history that was about the relationships between blackness and the Muslim third world that was anti-imperialist, right? And this is part of not only a, uh, this is part of the way in which I tried to tell this prehistory to 9-11, that there's this other relationship between blackness and the Muslim third world that is about anti-imperial struggle Right, as opposed to one about reinforcing the politics of U.S. empire. Right? <laughs> and so in the book, I really open up with Malcolm X. And I talk about Malcolm X's emergence um, in the post-World War II black radical tradition, trying to situate him within uh, a broader arc of radical thinkers and actors, including Kenyatta and Fanon, uh, Padmore, Du Bois, right? Um, Claudia Jones, several other actors that I kind of placed Malcolm in. And in doing so, uh, what I tried to situate Malcolm and this black radical tradition that I'm talking about is in opposition to or challenging the current kind of, at the, mo at the time current, civil rights orthodoxy that began to emerge. And so this is part of um, the work that a whole host of kind of new historiography on the civil rights movement has come out, Penny Von Eschen and Brenda Gale Plummer and Thomas Bortlesman and Dudziak and a whole host of people have kind of talked about 
this, this emergence of this civil rights movement in its relationship to the Cold War, right? And it's a logic of civil rights that is very much with us today. Um, in fact, it's a logic that in many ways some argue and celebrate through the election of Obama. That is to say that Obama's presidency and his election is, is a legitimation of this triumphalist civil rights narrative. Civil rights is what got Obama elected, right? It's part of this kind of narrative that civil rights put forth. Um, and I'll read from the beginning part of the book where I kind of frame that in a particular way. But if, if civil rights is what's being triumphed today and it's being celebrated today, as I argued in the beginning of the book, how did it emerge? What did it come out of, right? And it's important for us to think about that every time we hear about uh, appeals to pluralism, diversity, multiculturalism, we have to remember that they're historically specific, right? And they're rooted in very particular moments, right? So that today, when we think about appeals to multiculturalism and pluralism and colorblindness, it's specific to a particular moment in time, what people are now calling the post-racial, with the black president, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But the appeals to what has been called racial liberalism of the Cold War came out of a particular context too. They came out of a particular set of constraints um, and expectations and assumptions about the role and place of the United States in the world at large, right? And so what were those constraints? What was that world view? What was taking place? And as I talk about in the book, and I'll mention very briefly, um, was this kind of post-World War II moment where a kind of vibrant black left is asserting itself within kind of U.S. political culture in terms of the kinds of claims it's trying to make on social justice projects here in the United States for African Americans and their relationship to third world anti-colonial struggles around the world. This is part of this new historiography that's been emerging, uh, that Robin and several others have been a central part of uncovering, if you will, so to speak, um, and making contemporary. Uh, but the relationship that this vibrant black left had to the third world and seeing white supremacy as a kind of global phenomenon, right? But something happens in 1947 called the Truman Doctrine and the Declaration of the Cold War. Um, where, Truman, where Truman declares that anti-communism is the biggest threat to democracy, the hard-fought democracy that was won after World War II and to U.S. state interests. Anti-communism becomes the kind of uh, MO for U.S. statecraft, both domestically and globally. So that it argued that where communism reared its head in the third world, the United States had to go in unilaterally if need be and undo that. I mean, it sounds very familiar with anti-terrorism today, right? Because the argument for the United States was communism was a bigger threat to the third world than colonialism. Right? This, was the, this was the assumption. Communism was a bigger threat to the third world than colonialism. So better, maintain, better to maintain colonial relations in the third world than to have them liberate themselves according to this logic, create a vacuum and have the communists come in. So we need to maintain these colonial relationships. So this is in essence what the United States does. This is what the Marshall Plan was about, that Robeson and Du Bois and a whole host came out vocally and spoke out against, right? This was what the Atlantic Charter was that Churchill put in place, that the United States had to kind of tap into its logic as well and support. Right? It was about, let's maintain colonial relations in the third world. Let's not allow them, to use some problematic language, to gain their independence. Right? And so this idea that communism was a bigger threat to the third world and colonialism is what essentially maintained and supported and edified U.S. foreign policy. But domestically, some work needed to be done. And I talk about the work that was done domestically amongst this black left that got split as a result of this anti-communist position the U.S. was now taking. Because the U.S. knew, as did many black actors and activists here in the country during the time, that in order for the United States to gain support or traction in the third world, in the non-white world, where they had already been subject to centuries of European colonialism and the logic of the white man's burden and white supremacy. In order to gain traction there, 
the images of lynchings, of hoses on, 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 on protesters, separate but equal doctrine, right? Segregation in education, transportation, housing, etc. That wasn't going to convince the third world that the United States was a just arbiter in global affairs. That wasn't going to convince them. They were, in fact, going to, they potentially could turn to the Soviet Union. And I write about how in, you know, whether it be from uh, Truman's own Commission on Civil Rights that comes out and admits this, our image, our, 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 our treatment of blacks here is indicative of uh, how people see us abroad and what they think about us. I quote, kind of ironically, Ralph Bunch. I quote Adam Clayton Powell and a whole host of other kind of like black actors and activists who are talking about the importance of uh, black equality in the United States in, tor in order to achieve U.S. foreign policy goals abroad, right? Because what happens is the black left that I was speaking about splits apart. And in splitting, a mainstream wing emerges that we now know as civil rights, right? And, and I'm not here to argue that this splitting and the emergence of we, what we now call civil rights was kind of like, you know, the cop-out move or the sell-out move. What I'm here to suggest to you is that, you know, as, as the saying goes, don't hate the player, hate the game, right? What were the constraints that were in place that did not allow black, any, any kind of uh, relief from the kind of racial violence the black folk in the United States were facing. So as a result, they said, look, we'll support you, a wing breaks up, we'll support you in this anti-communist adventure of yours. But you have to pass legislation that's going to end lynching, desegregate public transportation, housing, uh, pass a Voting Rights Act, a whole host of measures. If we are going to jump on board with this anti-communist logic, and so this is the deal that essentially gets made, in a way. I call, call it a deal as if it was some backroom deal made with guys smoking cigars. I, I, I'm, not saying, I'm not trying to suggest that, but this was the agreement or the consensus that came to be shared. So that what ended up happening, as Penny Von Eschen and others argued, was that for the mainstream wing of black political culture, they no longer identified with the politics of the third world. The phrase, Negroes are Americans, became the kind of rallying cry for the civil rights establishment. Right? Which was in contrast to many who remained on the black left who continued to tie black claims for dignity and justice in the United States to the larger third world. And there's a whole host of actors, you know, artists and activists that I talk about in the book um, that I've already mentioned. The one who emerges as the maybe most powerful voice is Malcolm X, right? And I talk about how Malcolm emerges out of this moment. He emerges out of this Cold War moment. And in emerging, Malcolm does so by tying, as, as Malcolm would say, if you want to understand what's going on in Mississippi, you have to understand what's going on in the Congo, right? He talked about in Message to the Grassroots, the same man, you know, that's essentially burning churches in Alabama, is the same man that's been colonizing people in Afghanistan and Pakistan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And in that speech message to the grassroots, Malcolm uses, as I talk about, the Bandung Conference of 1955 as this model and template for thinking about or hoping to rethink about black political culture in the United States. He's arguing that, as Malcolm argued at the Bandung Conference, the one thing that was not there was the white man, right, in, in, in a very kind of strident tone. But what Malcolm was suggesting was that for this mainstream wing of civil rights, you know, who broken off from this black radical tradition, we needed to recalibrate our politics in a particular way and think in terms of a, what the Revolutionary Action Movement called years later a Bandung humanism, right? So I, I trace out this kind of history uh, for you, but also in chapter one in the book, because Malcolm and, 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 and the kind of forces that he was challenging kind of shape the rest of the text. 
in terms of like thinking about how this black radical tradition and its relationship in particular to the Muslim third world animated itself, right? So for Malcolm, I talk for example about the, the conversion narrative and the power of the conversion narrative in the nation of Islam, right? Um, and I talk about how, you know, from the so-called slave name to then the X to then the original name, so-called, right? Uh, and what this suggested about a certain kind of aesthetics of selfhood, right? And how through this transformation and conversion narrative, black people define themselves not only before America, that is to say, we were something before we were slaves, right? But they define themselves beyond America, what Amiri Baraka later called uh, a post-American identity, right? And so for Malcolm, Mecca becomes this kind of signal, spiritual, and philosophical center. But I also talk about the ways in which Cairo and Palestine and Algeria and Bandung become these kind of signal spaces for Malcolm to begin to expand and think about the politics of third world internationalism, right? And this framework of Malcolm's, you know, I then begin to see influence as I, in terms of the, the histories that I'm looking at, as I argued before, the Black Power movement, right? So the Black Panther Party, you know, as Huey and Bobby talk about, is kind of indebted to the work of Malcolm X, right? I talk about then the influence that Malcolm and these international politics had on Black Power. Um, I go on then talking about, in chap that was chapter one, the Black Power chapter is chapter two. In chapter three, I go on talking about um, how in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, through hip hop culture, right, the kind of predominant narrative amongst the so called golden age, I know there might be some older heads in the crowd, <laughs> and that would be me, um, who, 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 who harken back to the golden age um, of hip hop, 86 to 94, 95, say, right, for the most part, that golden age is kind of replete with. References and the influence of Islam in different iterations, whether it be the 5%, the Nation of Islam, right, and so called. And I talk about this influence, but I talk about it in the sense that, like, while the golden age of hip hop was this moment of hip hop kind of cutting its political teeth on a particular kind of politics of Afrocentricity and Islam that was challenging kind of the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton years of war on crime and war on drugs. You know, I, I framed these war on crime and war on drugs uh, uh, as really proxies and a kind of counterinsurgency against the emergence of a black left post-black power, right? And so I say that hip hop is responding to this new proxy war, right? And in doing so, uh, as hip hop was emerging, I talk about the debates that hip hop was in in the late 80s, early 90s, and much of it was about hip hop hearkening back to a black arts tradition. Right? Hip hop, at, the, at that time, a lot of the debates were coming up about what is hip hop, what role is it going to have in society, how is it going to lead black youth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I think for the most part people have given up on it now um, in terms of like the mainstream conversations. But at that time, that was one of the dominant narratives in terms of how to think about hip-hop. And the black arts movement kept coming back. And so I talk about how, in that chapter, the black arts movement itself was deeply influenced by the presence of Islam, right? And African-American Muslims who had either converted or used the themes and ideas of Islam within black arts writing. And I'm talking about Marvin X's, like Fly to Allah, the Black Fire Anthology, if you look in it, it's, it's replete. I also talk about the influence of it on jazz, Yusuf Latif and Art Blakey, um, you know, Randy Weston later, um, you know, somebody even talked about John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. Uh, he says A Love Supreme 19 times, which is a sacred number for Muslims. Some have said, I'm not sure I'm convinced, but as you go to about the 13th or 14th time he starts to say it, it's not A Love Supreme, it's A Law Supreme. Uh, you know, but I, some people might be reaching, but some have argued that. But if you read the liner notes to A Love Supreme, it's the English transliteration of the opening lines of the Quran. Right? So there are these connections here being made through jazz as well. And so I talk about this in the hip hop chapter in terms of antecedents to hip hop and talk about the role of Muslim MCs in terms of like challenging kind of the logic of mass incarceration that was being put in place. Um, and of course the emergence at that time of again the figure of Malcolm X, right? Malcolm emerges again in the late 80s and early 90s as this kind of pivotal and iconic figure within hip hop culture. In fact, maybe next to Farrakhan, uh, 
Malcolm might be the most sampled voice in all of hip hop, right? And I talk about, you know, 80, 1983, the first arguably hip hop, you know, instrumental that came out was Keith LeBlanc's No Sellout. It has Malcolm's image on there, it's Malcolm's voice in there, right? And then kind of how Malcolm continues to emerge as this figure within hip hop culture in different ways. Um, of course, culminating in Spike Lee's biopic in 92, right? Um, so, I talk about this influence within hip hop, not just in the 80s and 90s, but even all the way up until today with, you know, artists like Yasin Bey, Most Def, uh, you know, Lupe Fiasco, of course, um, um, Odyssey, uh, Freeway, you know, uh, the different iteration, Brother Ali, Jaziri X's new album is pretty good too. Um, so, so the tradition kind of continues, and so I talk about that as well. Um, and I then go in to talk about, um, the influence in the 1990s of the emergence of Muhammad Ali as this kind of American hero. And the way in which Ali gets co-opted and re-emerges just as Malcolm also has emerged. And black youth through hip hop are kind of articulating a kind of more radical politic. Ali comes back as this kind of national hero. Right, um, and I talk about this in the context of the debates over the culture wars, um, and how Ali comes to kind of uh, create this kind of redemptive narrative for the kind of post Cold War civil rights narrative that emerges in the 1990s. Right, um, and I talk about you know of course all these po all these politics in the 60s and 70s, but then what they become in the 1990s is really ironic. I don't know what this says. I was at a talk at the University of Kentucky. Um, and maybe that says enough, but, you know. <laughs> but I mentioned Muhammad Ali, and somebody said, wait, is he Muslim? I said Muhammad Ali, right? I mean, that's, I mean, how obvious do you have to be? Like, you don't have to even, right? Somebody has to ask that question. So there's a way in which Ali himself has almost been stripped away of his Muslimness, if you will. Right? He's become this kind of, in some ways, national mascot for a particular kind of, you know, uh, uh, affirming politics about the civil rights era. Right? And then I finally close, as my editor argued, or said to me on a very somber note, my book ends on a very somber note, he argues, on the role of the prison. And the way in which the prison kind of um, has become this space where uh, Islam is being cl clamped, down, clamped down on for the fear of, again, a Malcolm X emerging. emerging. And I talk about that, the, the crackdown on black Muslim prisoners here in the United States and the rise of imperial incarceration abroad with Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo and uh, of all of you hopefully are aware of the, the brothers who are on the hunger strikes now. Um, so I talk about the relationship between imperial imprisonment and you know, the emergence of uh, CMUs, control management units here in the United States, which are prisons within prisons, which are housing only Muslim prisoners, right? Um, and, and how the fear of the emergence of a figure like a Malcolm X is still part of the logic of US statecraft, right? And so I talk about this connection through um, the prison writings of Imam Jamil al -Amin formerly H. Rat Brown, who is now in a federal supermax prison in Florence, Colorado, um, after being accused of and then convicted of killing a police officer in Atlanta, Georgia um, in 2000. Um, and some of us were really central in um, throwing a benefit concert for him here in LA in May of 2001. Uh, with Most Def and Talib Kweli and Dilated Peoples and J5 and a whole host of others. Um, but that was five months before 9-11. 9-11 happens and all of a sudden he becomes the homegrown terrorist, right? And so um, I talk about, you know, this emergence in the post 9-11 era of the prison as this site for containing what in many ways is the overarching structure of the book containing what I call the Muslim International, right? And this Muslim International becomes this kind of non-national space that I talk about that borrows from a particular kind of left politics that becomes a space for both formal and informal politics to emerge. Um, arts, politics, culture, everyday forms of resistance um, that Robin and uh, writers like Asif Bayad have talked about. Um, as well as kind of more formal and traditional and conventional forms of resistance, whether it be armed insurgency or attempts at kind of like achieving state power. So the Muslim International becomes this kind of arc for thinking through and thinking about these kinds of politics. Um, and so that's kind of the scope of the book. 
Um, in a nutshell, I'm sure there's, hopefully there's a lot of questions um, that I could take, but I uh, appreciate you guys' time, and we can open up the floor for questions. Any questions? My man. Um, you mentioned uh, Asada. Mm -hmm. in, her, in her um autobiography, did she mention, because I, I read the autobiography, but I don't know if she mentioned how she escaped from Clinton Correct. Did she, did she ever mention that specifically in her book? Yeah, it was her brother. People can fill me in on the details, but it was her brother. She doesn't mention that, right. though. Yeah, for yeah. Right. yeah, for a reason. Yeah. And we're not here to give away secrets. Other people have put the pieces together yeah, and talked about it. How right. she got out. Right. I didn't know how she got out for sure because right. it was vacant. Right, right. And if you think about it, I mean, you know, the first rap group to mention her was Public Enemy, although Chuck calls her uh, Chesimard. He doesn't call her Shakur. Yeah. But maybe that's a coded sliding way of getting her in. But if you think about even Public Enemy's video, Black Steel and the Hour of Chaos, right, it's about a whole escape from prison narrative. It's very much about kind of Asada in a particular way. Yeah. I don't know if you want to say something more, Robin, to that? Oh, okay. Go ahead. So why would you say that they suddenly raised Asada and put it in the paper last Friday that she's on the list now after decades? I mean, what was the, the motivation of the FBI to do that? Uh, Probably several. I'm not. I mean, you know, we. Can, I'm not going to hear to think that I can get into the, that kind of thinking. But okay. you know, um, I mean, it was the 40 year anniversary of yeah. Forrester's death, the officer who she's accused of killing. Right? It was the 40th anniversary of it. I, I mean, I'm sure that was the kind of moment, right? And if those of you seen the press conference, it's an African American kind of FBI agent who's talking about how this is the proudest day of his life, and you know, she's. A, and, and if you think about, if you listen to, if you listen to his language, he says she continues to espouse anti-American, revolutionary ideas, blah 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 blah. She's a domestic terrorist who also happened to kill a cop. So she's a domestic terrorist for her ideas, who also happened to kill a cop. Those are two separate things to them in a particular way, right? Um, and so I think it had to do with the 40th anniversary of, of, of the incident, right? But... Um, something else that you said, though, that you, you, you might have actually explained it. I mean, we're in the shadow of Guantanamo, a right. hunger strike, right. and mm -hmm. she's in Cuba. Right, and, for sure. And, and, and in the, at a moment when there's debates about the use of drones, right. You know, who knows? Right. Which I, which I talked about in the piece. Like, is it far-fetched now? I wrote a piece in Al Jazeera when I mentioned that. If, is it far-fetched that the U.S. would target, do a target assassination on Assad Shakur in Cuba right now with a drone strike? Is it, is it that far-fetched? According to the assumptive logic of the war on terror and the logic of terrorism, they've already done this. They are doing it. Right? So, according to this logic, would that happen? I'm not saying it would. I, I'm more skeptical that it would, but the logic would allow for it to happen, right? And not to mention, right, the material support for terrorism charge, right, which has gotten a whole host of young Muslim men locked up for the most part after being entrapped and on trumped up charges. FBI sting operation, Trevor Aronson's book, The Terror Factory, really reveals this. It just came out, right? But there's been a whole host of activism including amongst hip-hop, the Black August movement, for those of you who aren't familiar, in the late 90s, early 2000s. The Black August movement, Most Def and Quali and Dead Prez and Common, and a whole host of artists who went both to Havana and to South Africa. Black August was about raising consciousness for political prisoners. They raised money to support her and Cuban solidarity initiatives. According to these laws, this is essentially material support for terrorism now. Can they be charged in the same way that Muslim charities have been charged and people locked up? So essentially, this is also about, as Robin mentioned, Guantanamo, but it's also about activists today doing work on prison abolition, police brutality, protesting imperialism, all the same things that Assad was fighting for at that time. It's about having a chilling effect on those kinds of activities today. Again under the rubric of terrorism or anti-terrorism, right? This is the way in which, in a similar period, anti-communism narrowed the scope of dissent. Anti-terrorism, I argue, is doing something similar today. Right, Mark? Yeah, just, just to comment on this line, whenever something involves Cuba, we have to look to the politics of South Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and Florida, we just can't get away from Florida, can we? Yeah. <laughs> I think one mistake that the left sometimes makes when we look at the federal government is we think of it as a unitary, undifferentiated sure. body. Um, 
if you notice, the ICE agents and units have been suing the Obama administration, sure. demanding more deportation, saying we want to, and, and people, also the mainstream media forgot that what Bush did, both in DOJ and in Homeland Security and ICE, was they burrowed in political people into more career positions. Mm -hmm. So if you understand what's going on here is if you follow the Jay-Z Beyonce thing, if you follow, this is all folks trying to push Marco Rubio as a presidential candidate. Mm. And what they want to provoke is, is a confrontation between the Obama administration and Cubans in South Florida over issues related to Cuba. So mm. so-called career FBI people put Shakur on that list, daring Holder to take her off. Right. And 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 yeah. say and then say and think of how the politics this sure. is this yeah. is the Obama administration defending black radical terrorists who right. were shielded by the cash. Right. Program. Right. And if we remember what happened in the two thousand election, what happened right before with Janet Reno and Elian Gonzalez, right. we can see what the, the gambit is right. here. And you're gonna see a lot more of it. Um, this also all started about at the, in the waning days of the Bush administration, when through USAID in the Mississippi, Mississippi Consortium, um, they funneled the, the Cuban members of Congress funneled a bunch of money into H, under resource HBCUs to generate all this research on how the Cuban Revolution was racist, um, and then they tried to call a bunch of us scholars to validate it at a conference at at Howard University. Um, but we did the research and found out who was behind it. One guy had come and sort of copied my research, published it, but didn't put any of the caveats and the stuff in it. And some of us refused to go. We wrote pieces about it. Um, and so this is a concerted effort to use race and blackness for a particular project sure. mm -hmm. that's attempting to do a particular set of political work in South Florida. Mm. So the. The drones, the, the, sometimes the, the story, and, and in particular when you start thinking about these different policies and like state policies, is there's a whole sort of complicated sure. relationship. Because the Obama administration doesn't want to talk about black radicalism even to denounce it. Right, right, right. <laughs> right. right. They don't even want to talk about it to denounce right. it. So right. I just wanted to, to clarify no. that because those of us in the Cuba community have been sort of watching the, the setups here and are really concerned about uh, how everybody's positioning themselves. Right. And that. Have you I haven't written it yet. You need to write it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, right. Actually, because you can just, I would, I would, I would have taped it and just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's being taped, right? We're all being taped, right? Okay, I'll yeah. make it out, Rob. Right, yeah. Nice. Anybody else? Thank you for that, Mark. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, well, it, it, I think Mark's question actually clarified a lot of it. Um, I mean, I was just going to ask about, you know, what we've been talking about the last couple of minutes was kind of the, the, the relationship between blackness and all these various campaigns and projects mm -hmm. that, um, you know, target, in, in, in one instance, you know, um, you know kind of the anti-communist uh, campaign, but then, of course, anti-terrorism. Right. And you know, um, and you know, I was kind of struck by the the point you were making about the I guess the the, the bargain that was kind of struck between the, the mainstream civil rights movement at a particular point and the nation state, you know, right. in terms of you know you know uh, in, in, in kind of exchange for uh, you know supporting our anti-communist campaign, sure. you know, we're gonna kind of ameliorate some of the the, the, the issues associated with, you know, um, black oppression. You right, know, right. In the civil rights movement and kind of the, the logical, I guess, culmination of that. But then, of course, toward the end of what most people would consider the, the mainstream civil rights movement, you have, you know, figures like MLK opposing the Vietnam War and all right, those other things. Right. I'm just wondering kind of how um, the key players that we typically associate with right. these movements, um, you know, um, how their actions, I guess, um, 
um, change at various points given what it appears that um, uh, kind of their relationship to state efforts might be. Right. And Bunch is another figure. Bunch is another figure, who, right. Who, who also talks about, you know, kind of his, his, his difficulty sort of, sort of managing what he would like to do and right. how he thinks he might be, be used right. at various points in right. government propaganda. Right. We talked about that. Right. Yeah, and I, th and I think that's a great point. I mean, I think that, you know, in talking about the civil rights uh, project, like I said, it's a project that today has... It, it defines the United States in so many ways, right? It's about, it, it embodies social struggle. It, it embodies, you know, the use of the Constitution and legislative and judicial arms to form that more perfect union, right? It's, it's the kind of quintessential master narrative for the United States, this civil rights logic. And, and not only that, it redeems America. Right. It, 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 the logic of it redeems America. So it continues to, for lack of a better word, word haunt us, right? And as Darnell pointed out, you know, the patron saint of the civil rights movement, within a year and a half of the passage of the 64 and 65 bills, essentially abandons it. Dr. King, in his speech at the Riverside Church, you know, in 1967, April 3rd, 1967, right? If you haven't heard that speech, I try and hear it once a month just to get, keep me going, right? You know, he, he says, he, and, he, and he had a big, and for those of you who know this history, right, he breaks from the civil rights orthodoxy. And he says in the speech, and, and all my advisors are telling me, don't tie civil rights to Vietnam. Don't tie anti-imperialism to civil rights. Keep these realms separate. Right? And King says he can no longer bear that moral and ethical burden. And he argues, and, and this is why I disagree with a figure like, with, with Marable's book on Malcolm. He argues, Marable argues that Malcolm became more like King, when in fact King became more like Malcolm. King argues that we have to now think beyond the nation in that Riverside speech. He says that, think beyond the nation. Right? He said we have to listen to those people that our government calls enemies or terrorists. They might have something to say about us. Because if we don't, as King dramatically stated, if we don't, America's tombstone will read Vietnam. Right? And so King himself breaks from this so-called sacred and hallowed tradition of civil rights within two years of the bills being passed. Of course, this leads a year later to him being assassinated for those very ideas, which comes to sh give you a sense of how at a very early phase, if you will, in this long durée of civil rights, the U.S. has been invested in this project of civil rights, right? That they assassinate King in 68 within years of those bills being passed because of his break from it, right? And it continues, like I say, to have this kind of traction today. Um, and again, at the beginning of the book, I talk about Obama's inauguration, the first one in 09 on King's birthday, and the way in which Feinstein introduces uh, King. I just want to read real quick, right? Um, uh, some, co some comments by Feinstein. I write, um, a key and telling moment occurred when Feinstein of California gave the introductory remarks of Obama's inauguration. Quote, those who doubt the supremacy of the ballot over the bullet can never diminish the power engendered by nonviolent struggles for justice and equality like the one that made this day possible. Right? So she's invoking both Malcolm and Martin. Malcolm is still laboring and haunting the highest levels of the U.S. state. Right? And Feinstein is invoking both, and a particular era of King. Of course, she's not going to invoke 67, 68 King. She's going to invoke 63, 64 King. But King continues to be this figure that's held up. And even, like I said, at Obama's election, because of that black radical tradition that's trying to be silenced, that black internationalist tradition that's trying to be silenced, it's attempting to wed the idea of blackness to the U.S. nation state solely and exclusively. Not in an either or or both and situation, but exclusively. Right? And that's what I think is what's troubling about this civil rights project. Right? Anybody else have any other questions? In the back, go ahead. Well, um, my name is Kate. I work with Revolution Books. I'm part of a movement for revolution now. And I just, I thought this point about the deal, because I actually think it probably was a backroom deal, struck between go against the communists. Because remember, China. Sure. China was the biggest thing that was had. That's what, that's what brought the Panthers forward, and it changed everything in, in this country. I wouldn't be here. <laughs> you know, if it weren't for the Panthers. But 
I think you got to ask, how did it work out for people? I mean, capitalism doesn't even look good on fucking paper. You know what I mean? And it's like the real, the reality of what went on right. under socialism, right. when it was socialist, before right. the coup in 76, is something that people right. need to know about. Because right. your point about prisons and what's happening in prisons and mass incarceration in yeah, the sure. country, sure. 2.4 million people in prison, most right. people of color, right. I don't think it's just a Malcolm figure. Right. I think they're afraid of the rebellion and the, and, and the kind of struggle that needs to go on against this right. system. And I remember Attica. No, and I think you're right. I mean, I, th and I think that like that's, you know, that issue of, you know, this is what many have been writing about, what, what was gained 45, 50 years now after civil rights. As Michelle Alexander, right, more black men are in prison now than were enslaved in 1820. What are the, diff what are the gaps between black wealth and white wealth? Black income and white income, educational attainment. What are those differences? Like, so if this deal was made, an argument could be made that if the deal was made and you got what you wanted, then it was worthwhile. That argument can be made. It might not be the most ethically sound argument, you know, in terms of dealing with white supremacy globally. But if you wanted to think along real politic and the real pragmatic nature of how it goes down, you know, you could do that with that argument. But all the stats and facts tell us something radically different. And so the question then becomes, why continue to buy into this logic? And I close that in the epilogue primarily targeting the Muslim community, who after 9-11 have assumed this kind of Muslims are Americans to apologetic posture, right? That is not about critiquing white supremacy, US imperialism, et cetera, et cetera. That they're buying into this same civil rights framework at the expense of anti-imperial struggles and other popular people's struggles taking place around the world, right? Just. Go ahead. Go. So, um, you kind of acknowledged the importance of this question already when you started the scholarship um, report. I was just sort of wondering, um, so when we talk about a politics of the only nation state, when we're talking about a politics of solidarity and anti-imperialist politics, I'm kind of wondering, like, where are the moments of um, contradiction, right? Where, how do we paper over them? And specifically because you've addressed gender already, and also, you know, class and race. And, Obviously, we're talking about religion as well because you're talking about Islam. And to some extent, like, how do we, as a, um, I mean, I don't know if you identify as a historian, but like, how do, how does one talk about the contradictions, those moments of intersectionality where, you know, um, there are conflicts, and then are they are they intense? Is the solidarity intensified in those moments, or is it sort of? You know, is it overlooked? What happened? Hopefully not overlooked, if I understand your qu well, question I mean, correctly. Right. right. I would, I would never really re reject the idea that I'm a historian, especially right. with certain people know. in the room. Yeah, I'm, that's the last, I, I turned into one kind of by default, you know, with my own training. All of a sudden I was like, I'm a historian, I'm in archives. Um, you know, but I'm not a historian. But speak to it as well, I'm asking. Like yeah, sure, how do we begin to think about those contradictions or those tensions? Absolutely, right, I mean, we can't, wave the banner of a particular kind of logic or liberation, you know, framework and paper over these questions around gender, around sexuality, around class, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure how specific you mean. You yeah, I'm just kind of, like, I just, I struggle with this question and I just don't know how one speaks to those moments. And right. really not for divisive reasons, but right. intensified. Right, quality. right. Well, I mean, I think that those are the questions. I mean, there's a big debate now that's taking place. Um, I'll see you tonight, Robin. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a big debate going on, you know, the big debate about pinkwashing in Israel, right, and what's going on, that, that the way in which Israel's used kind of homophobia as this way of kind of further talking, further st stigmatizing kind of issues around Palestine, right, um, as if to kind of take, take away, it's a way of kind of deflecting from questions of the occupation and et cetera, and it's become this kind of hotbed issue that there was a whole conference at CUNY recently that I was in New York uh, attending um, around how pink washing is being used as a way of kind of, you know, uh, letting Zionism off the hook in a particular way. Israel uses it as a way of kind of further coding the Palestinians as, as homophobic, etc. So uh, I think that it's alive and well. And I think, you know, obviously when we talk about like the so-called Muslim world, gender becomes a very 
yes. predominant lens and a way in which kind of imperial feminism can take root, right? Of course, you know, as Bush argued, we're going to Afghanistan to save the women, mm-hmm. right? We have Alex. Time for one kind of question and then closing remarks by um, Dr. Hunt. And if you'd like copies of uh, the book, the bookstore is here to, uh, Thank to help you with that. Uh, George. Thank you so much for this talk. It's really inspiring. The book's great. Uh, Thank you, man. So, uh, I always learn a lot from you. And it's in that spirit that I asked the question. Um, you know, the early civil rights era, I'm trying to write about it as well, and this, the logic of the um, Cold War civil rights thesis, I mean, you, you lay it out in the historiography, this idea that there was it helped advance the struggle against Jim Crow. A little bit. Dunziak, I think, at least. Right, right. right. And so, I, this is certainly not Penny Von Esch and this is no. not Nikhil Singh. Sure. It's not that sector, but others, I think, within that, when you use that notion, people think that it actually helped advance it, whereas Manning Marable, you know, says, actually, the Cold War set back more than five decades. Exactly. So, I just wonder if you could clarify that a, a little bit. Right. I don't know where you stand, but if you could help them. Yeah, and I think that's absolutely a good point. I mean, I think what I was talking about, this kind of snapshot moment in a particular way where this break happened, if we can even point to a particular moment when this break happens. But it becomes, if not a snapshot, at least an opening and a slippery slope to a certain way of thinking about blackness and race in relationship to U.S. empire, right? And, you know, as we talked about in terms of, like, if we, go, if we, if we were able then as we are now, to look 50 years, you know, in the future, we would see that the civil rights, this deal that was made, um, as you argue, Nikhil and Manning and, and Penny have argued, it didn't amount to what it expected to. And in, in fact, it, it, it derailed, right, like kind of social movements for, for, for social justice for black folk, right? At, at the very time it was happening. It completely split apart this black left, right? So that, that, that's the short answer to the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I've been told I have to cut it out. All right. Thank you guys so much. Okay, thank you so hell for a very uh, provocative. Thank you all for joining us with uh, questions and comments. Um, just want to, before we go, make a few announcements about upcoming events we have here at the center. Um, Wednesday, May 15th, I believe that's next Wednesday, at 3 o'clock, here in this room, Images and Blackness film series. Um, we have a screening of a film along with, um, I believe the director of the film, uh, Professor C.A. Griffith and H.L. T. Kwan, a film called Mountains That Take Wing, Angela Davis and Yuri Kochiyama, A Conversation of Life, Struggles, and Liberation. That's next Wednesday at 3. Uh, the following day, Thursday, the 16th at noon, we have a Circle of Thought lecture series uh, with Professor Sharon Luck from Stanford. Uh, the title of the, uh, the book is uh, Between Star Shine and Clay, The Black Radical Tradition and Future Directions in Comparative Ethnic Studies. So black uh, uh, Radical Tradition is kind of going to display here for the next couple of weeks, huh? And um, the same day, um, May 16th at 4 p.m., we have an event that we're co-sponsoring going to be held at the Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics Lecture Hall 1200, which is right down, kind of between here and South Campus. Uh, It's part of the Environmental Justice Lecture Series here on campus. Uh, We have Professor Carl Maida from UCLA and Robin Cannon, who's the president of uh, Concerned Citizens of South Central Los Angeles. We're going to be talking about their respective efforts to improve um, uh, environmental justice in, in the region. So thank you again, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.